Another adventure in uh, TRS-80 color computing on the Coco Show. I'm your good buddy, your good pal, Amigo Aaron. I want to give a shout out to my usual partner, the Brent, uh, who is celebrating the birth of his first granddaughter. So congratulations to his son and his wife for having a lovely, beautiful daughter. Hopefully we'll get the Brent back here. In the next uh, go-around on the Coco Show, he's taking some needed time off to take care of his family. So congratulations to them. Hey, we've got a real fun one today, uh, in my opinion, because we're going to be looking at a game uh, simply known as Sinistar. Sinistar. Oh, that's with two A folks. But you and I know who he really takes after. Uh, a game based on the beloved arcade classic. And I've been uh, itching to get around to this one because, believe it or not, this is one I had not played until this week. And I am a fan of the arcade uh, machine, for sure. Uh, and before we get into the uh, titular title of Sinistar with two A's, let's talk about Sinistar with just one A. Uh, this game uh, came out uh, at a time when Williams Electronics was really uh, going to work in the arcades. You know, Williams uh, was known primarily as a pinball company. And, and by the way, they did great work. Uh, Williams, an all-time great pinball, maybe the greatest pinball uh, collection of all times. Uh, but they also, as you know, dipped their toe in the pool of arcade gaming and had such classics as Joust and Robotron. And this is another one of their uh, classics, Sinistar. So, this one's designed by Noah Faustine and John Newcomer, programmed by Sam Dicker. And here's an interesting tieback if you're a fan of our sister show, The Amigos. This was uh, handled also in the special effects department by R.J. Michael of uh, Amiga fame, the gentleman who created the, uh, uh, the UI for Amiga Intuition and also helped design the Amiga hardware. Uh, they also had Ro uh, Richard Witt on board. They had uh, Ken Graham. They really had a committee affair when it came to designing some of these games. And amongst the people listed as working on this, aside from the ones I've just mentioned, uh, was uh, uh, Python uh, Angelo, who is a, uh, a big-time uh, you know, artist and designer in their pinball side. And so they had, uh, it was all hands on deck for this one. Uh, and w this was a beautiful arcade game. Uh, you know, had the cool... Williams had this thing for, like, the stenciled uh, stenciled cabinets and the really cool sound effects. A lot of the sound effects they had came directly from their pinball department. And if you go back and have a look at their pinball machines, you're going to find a lot of that same uh, audio library made its way over to its uh, to its arcade division. So... With all that said, you're thinking to yourself, wow, I know Sinistar the arcade game. I know how great it was and how popular. Uh, so how, how did it do on the home front? Well, amazingly, and I think there's a reason for this. If you'll recall, again, this was released uh, in the arcades in February of 1983. And uh, when they released this, uh, it was early days. And so a lot of uh, consoles and home computers just did not have the jack. Uh, to produce uh, what would be an effective and a uh, fun version of Sinistar. So it wasn't ever ported until well down the line when ports were made on the like uh, PlayStations and that era, the Midway Arcade Treasures and such. Uh, Sinistar got ported in that way. Now, there were a few attempts. Uh, believe it or not, there was an official attempt underway uh, for the BBC Micro and the Acorn Electron that was going to be uh, published in 84, and ultimately it was published, uh, but not under the name Sinistar because uh, 
apparently Atari was involved in helping get this out, and they pulled it out of the uh, BBC platform, according to the wiki. And so uh, this game went from being Sinistar to being called Death Star uh, and published by Superior Software in 84. Uh, I had a look at Death Star. I've got to say, uh, it does a good job of mimicking the arcade. Of course, again, um, and we'll talk about this later when we get to the Coco version, but Sinistar was a, uh, a vertical game. The, the, that means the arcade monitor was mounted vertically, and uh, you're porting these to basically TVs, horizontals. And so uh, this looks like the sideways version of the arcade. It's quite. I was very impressed. It's got the big chunky graphics you would expect from the BBC Micro, but they really quite they quite well mimic the arcade look and some of the heads up display and whatnot. Sadly, uh, it it does not have any audio for Sinistar or in this case Death Star. Uh, but I would say in terms of arcade um, accuracy, without having played it just by looking at it, it looks like it looks the closest to the arcade. Another unofficial port. Uh, is a clone on the Amiga of all places called Xeno Star, which uh, is a public domain game. This one I had a look at. Uh, it's pretty loose. It's probably it's obviously the most advanced. It came out in '94. Had the uh, had the uh, firepower of the Amiga behind it. And then this one, Xeno Star, does talk. Uh, and they they did not digitize audio from the arcade. They actually made their own audio. Uh, but this one, uh, I wasn't super keen on, if I'm honest. And also, I thought Zeta Star looked like a dork, the actual guy. He didn't look as cool as, uh, not even to say ballpark, as the arcade Sinistar. Uh, this one might be okay. It bears a look. Uh, it's one I'm gonna, it's on my it's on my list, but it's not one that I thought was all that impressive. So when I was uh, when I was a young man, and uh, the Coco was getting some real nice arcade ports. Uh, but I was out of the game before this thing came around the Coco. But I was happy to take a look at it this week because it looked like something that really someone put some work into. And once I figured out the backstory behind this, it all made sense. So let's get into it. So, <coughs> Sinistar with two A's uh, released for the Color Computer 3 uh, and, you, and, and required 512K RAM. Uh, this was released in 1989 <clears throat> on three discs. This did require 512 Coco 3. Uh, it did support a two-button co- uh, deluxe joystick and was priced at release uh, by th- at $34.95. It's funny, that actually is more reasonable than, than most Coco software would have been. <laughs> but this was 89 so I guess they were just, they'd cut the prices down a little bit to get these out the door. So... This is, when you boot this up, you get the publisher uh, logo that comes up in its very stylized way, which is uh, which is your sun dog. And then once that goes away, there's a period of loading where it shows just like um, a picture of two g- galaxies. You know, it's a nice space picture. Uh, there's quite a bit of loading that you have to go through because this is a three-disc game. And it'll ask you to put the second disc in the third disc in. And then you'll get you'll be treated to a logo screen, an animated logo screen uh, of something called Phantom Software. It looks like a uh, uh, one of the ma- like a theater mask, you know, the, and that splits apart in an interesting way. It's quite nice, but I'd never heard of Phantom Software and I didn't know anything about them. And so I looked and sure enough, uh, once again to the rescue, all hail L. Curtis Boyle, who turned me on to an interview that he had uh, helped conduct with David Dees the, from uh, Diacom. Uh, and Dave confirmed that, in fact, he was fan of software. And he had done this under their moniker for whatever reason. <clears throat> uh, when he, and he's the one that made this game. Now, he did have a helper, a partner in crime. Uh, his graphical assistant and voice digitization specialist, Glenn R. Uh, Dahlgren. Now, let's talk about Glenn real quick, and then we'll get into David D's uh, credits. Uh, Glenn, uh, a developer in his own right, uh, is credited for working on In Quest of the Star-Lord, Cume uh, Guy to be a Ninja, Warrior uh, King, 
Hall of the King 3, The Earth Stone Revealed, Kung Fu Dude, and Photon. Um, David D's credits are long. <laughs> Just to get into some, he was sort of the King Dong of converting arcade games into uh, Coco games. Just to go down his list, uh, he's responsible for Color Car Action, which is, a, of course, a bump and jump clone. Pump Man, which I believe is a Dig Dug clone. Gold Runner. Marble Maze, a Marble Madness clone. Knockout, a Punch-Out clone. Karate, which is sort of a uh, uh, fighting game. I guess you would, uh, a karate champ type clone. Uh, he also did Paper Route, which is Paperboy. Gauntlet, obviously that goes without saying. Uh, Bouncing Boulders, which is a Boulder Dash clone. Did a couple of light gun games, including Iron Forest, which we played at Boat Fest. Uh, Russian Assault. He did Gauntlet 2. Uh, he did a ton of games. And he actually did some legitimate stuff as well, if you can believe it. He did Robotron on the Lynx. Uh, he did Centipede on the Game.com, that ill-fated device. Uh, and what, Triple Play 2001 on the Game Boy Color. So he actually he did a little bit of everything and uh, was a real staple. If you want, if you want to know anything about the, uh, his, uh, his company... Dicom, you can go back, and I did a retrospective on one of my Friday Disaster Streets where I played out as many Dicom games as I could fit into a three-hour span. So he, his credits are lofty indeed. So, with all that said, once you've, uh, once you've fired up that third disc, uh, you are treated to uh, the game Sinistar, uh, complete with an interesting like a transitional screen where the logo prints all over. Uh, David did enjoy just changing the names of the arcade games slightly or changing one letter like Gauntlet. Uh, and so Sinistar with two A's uh, fits right into his wheelhouse. Um, this plays pretty close to uh, the arcade in a lot of ways. Uh, this does have a few things that will blow your mind. So again, this is a Coco 3 game and it required 512. So you're going to get a little more action. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's talk about the backstory of this before we get in the game proper. And I don't know if Sinistar had a backstory, so I guess David wrote one down. Uh, if you'll uh, if you'll indulge, I'm going to read it real quick. New Ursula was a peaceful twin galaxy. The inhabitants traded and prospered with a minimum hardship and warfare. Perhaps it was this calm which brought the Sinistars, that Sinistars plural, bent on nothing less than absolute destruction. But more likely it was the power of or so prevalent in many asteroids of the surrounding space that these fiends desired. It was this ore, which trans, which excuse me, it was this ore upon which populace based their civilization. The New Ursulans were not warriors and could not adequately defend themselves and their treasured ore from the looming menace from the stars. If only they had the power to convert the precious rock into weapons, the leader mused. It might be powerful enough to use against the Sinistars. The New Ursulans pooled their resources and created one ship. This ship was named the Marauder, the combined efforts of a twin galaxy. It had the ability to mine ore and convert it into, the, into something termed a Cinnabomb, which in quantities had enough power to destroy the Sinistars. They recruited the most able pilot in New Ursula and gave control of the Marauder to you, along with the combined hopes of all who lives they rest in your hands. Your mission is to fly into space, mine the asteroids, collect the power ore, and use the resulting Cinnabombs to rid the galaxy of the Sinistar. And that that's uh, an interesting take on the game due to the fact that, uh, you know, I always thought the Sinistar was like the Death Star. And each wave you were taking on a new one. But in this one, the Sinistars are actually the name of the, of the invaders and these huge bases are just their weapons of destruction. I'll, I'll buy it. Uh, the uh, game play mirrors exactly what the uh, intro says. Uh, and if you haven't played Sinistar or Sinistar, the uh, gameplay is relatively the same. You control a small but uh, fleet fighter as you roll around the, the galaxy mining asteroids. And at the top of this game screen, the screen's really divided into two parts. At the top center, there's a uh, there's a large radar screen that shows you your 
craft in the middle, and as you go around, it will show the uh, various elements of this galaxy come and go in your screen. So you can see them coming, and they're color-coded between enemies and the Sinistar itself and asteroids. Um, to the left and right of that are your scores for Player 1 and Player 2, and it also keeps track of the number of Cinnabombs uh, that you have mined and that are in your cargo hold. Uh, and then there's a, an interesting uh, floating light, light that flips down through. I think it's just for show. And then below that is the actual game screen. They do a pretty good job on this. I mean, the game screen takes up two-thirds of the screen. Of course, there's a big border around it. Uh, but that's a that doesn't really affect it because you do feel like you're in a pretty decently sized uh, play area because you'll be m scrolling through screen after screen. I mean, really, the play area itself is quite large. So... What do you do in this game? <clears throat> well, you play a fighter that has a gun. You can shoot anything in the game except for the Sinistar uh, and with your gun. Uh, some things uh, will, most things will just take one hit. So once you run around, you're going to notice that space is sort of jam-packed with stuff. And you can even run into most stuff and not have any problems except for the Sinistar. Um, there are lots of floating rocks in the, in the universe. Uh, and these floating rocks are your method to taking out Sinistar. You have to shoot these rocks. And as you shoot them, tiny little, like, pulsating crystals will shoot out the side, the bottom, in a random sp direction. These are the, the particles you need to, to manufacture the Cinnabombs. Every one of these you get is credited on your tiny little screen up there. I believe you can carry 20 of these. And... Uh, once you've once you have picked up the particle, it has been it automatically gets converted to a cinnabomb. Now, as you are doing this, you're going to see these little drone ships floating around, and they're also carrying cinnabombs. Uh, these drone ships are actually while you're mining the asteroid, so are they, and they're taking their cinnabombs to help build the Sinistar uh, in the middle of the screen, wherever he's at. And they're dropping these off, and the more they bring, the more pieces of him are completed. So you're asking yourself, well, heck, can I shoot one of these things and take its Sinistar or its Sinistar particle? Yes, absolutely. You can take its particle uh, just like you would mine one. On the flip side, and this is quite irritating, you can be chucking away at a, an asteroid and have one of these suckers come by and hork your particle. And it's a real pain in the butt, and they'll start scooting away. You'll have to chase them down and try to get it. So it's tit for tat in this. Uh, another adversary you'll have to deal with, aside from the rocks and the little mining bots, are these war bots, that, these warships that come out. These things are sort of hexagonal, and inside of them is a gun turret. You can see it move and follow you around as you move. And they shoot these very, very tiny red bullets. And at you, if a bullet hits you, it kills you. You can run into any of this stuff, and it won't kill you, but the, bu the their bullets do kill you. Um, these things tend to come in pairs, uh, and they are, uh, and sometimes more, as you get through the game, you'll see more and more of these. And these really are your number one adversary uh, until Sinistar wakes up. <clears throat> so, we know that these mining bots have been getting these... Uh, particles to take and build Sinistar. Once he's built, he will declare himself in an audible, t digitized speech. Uh, and it's very, I will say, this was this was the selling point of the arcade machine, Sinistar's speech, and it's the selling point of this game, too. You know, he'll wake up, and he'll be like, I hunger, run, coward. He badmouths you, and you'll see a, a large green dot on this on your radar screen you start moving around that sinistar he's active and when sinistar is active you've got to be careful because if you come up on him you certainly can't run into him if you touch him he will eat your ship he chows down on your ship while bad mouthing you uh in the arcade it was a real um it was a real wake-up call when you heard him shout out the first time and it it, it really adds to the tension and i will say it adds to the tension in this game as well. I mean, this this digitized sound on the Coco is outstanding. It's so good. Uh, you can absolutely tell. Uh, you can hear in the intro, that was straight from the game, 
uh, the the audio in this is just the, the best. They did a great job digitizing the sound. As I mentioned, uh, the, the voice you're hearing is not from the arcade. That's actually... Uh, that's actually Glenn R. Dahlgren, who actually did the voice. I believe he did the Jason as well. Uh, and even the rocks in this, because they tell a story on Coco Nation uh, that I watched, where David was actually taking chunks of gravel, I guess, and digitizing it to form the asteroids. And you could tell. They looked like little digitized asteroids. There. It's a quite a good effect, if I'm honest. Uh, and so once, once Sinistar is active... That's when you can start using your Cinnabombs. Now, you can come across Cinnastar as he's being built, uh, but you can't affect him until after he's fully operational. So if you shoot, and the, and the manual mentions this, if you if you try to go over and shoot Cinnabombs at Cinnastar as he's being built, it doesn't do anything. Once he's active and he comes, comes out, you can start hitting your Cinnabomb button and the Cinnabons will basically, they're like heat seekers. They'll, they'll go to him. You don't have to do anything. They'll, they'll find him. Uh, you know, when you get them on screen, you launch these suckers, and you get, and you get into it. Uh, once you've hit him enough times, and it will, I, as far as I can tell, he, he, becomes, he takes, requires more hits as you go through the game. Uh, you won't need 20 Cinnabons on the first level or the second level or even the third level, but you need an increasing amount. As you Cinnabom him, parts of him fly off, but he's still after you, and you basically have to keep shooting those Cinnabons until every part of him is gone, and except for the face floating around, and you load one more in there, and then and this game does it a little bit different in the arcade. I actually like what they did here. In the arcade, Sinistar will often explode off screen. You won't even see him go. In this game, once you hit that last bomb, your ship rolls up on him and shoots this incredible, like, all-encompassing lightning beam over him and just, and blows him away. So you, it's a more satisfying experience uh, when you play the uh, the Coco version because when you take him out, it's joyous. And then you'll get, your, get a bonus, and then you'll go into the second stage. In the arcade, the stages have names. This in this version, they just have they just have a stage number. Uh, as far as I could tell, uh, uh, yes, and this is mentioned in, in the in the manual. For every ten thousand points uh, points, you'll get an extra extra ship, uh, and that's also listed on the screen. Um, and the game just keeps going. I was able to get to level three. There's a video of someone get on uh, line getting past level three. Uh, but I could not get that far. Um, so, what do I think of this? Well, of course, this plays probably at half the speed of the arcade. The most jarring thing is, in the arcade, this game is um, so fast, it makes you nervous. Uh, it is real fast. In fact, I would say it's too fast. It's too fast for me to control it properly, and it was a real problem. For me, and that's one of the things I didn't like about the arcade version uh, 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 that much is that it was so fast that it was hard to figure out what was going on. Um, I like the Coco radar better than the arcade. I think it's you get more info. It's it's wider, so I do like that. So there's an advantage. Uh, the uh, the the armored the hexagonal ships with the rotating turret. Uh, are just, you know, they'll kill you in the arcade just like they will here. Like I said, that's sort of similar. The arcade is more, um, the, the space in the arcade version is more claustrophobic. Uh, there's a lot more crap floating around than I think there is in the, in the uh, Coco version of it. Uh, I know that um, I'm pretty sure that in the arcade version, you could just run into the asteroids and mine them. I don't think you have to shoot. Because I remember doing that. I, I gave the arcade version a shot uh, uh, this week as well. But I mostly played this one. Uh, but in this, you have to shoot them. And if you shoot an asteroid enough times, it just explodes. Which also happens in the arcade version. Um, Sinistar, the arcade man versus AA Sinistar. Sinistar in the arcade is cooler looking. I will say that. He's meaner looking than the Sinistar in the Coco version. But the Coco version, Sinistar... Looks pretty good, I have to say. You blow parts of them away, and the the voice in the Okoko version is so loud and clear, 
Uh, that it's every bit as startling as the arcade version. I will say that. That was what, something that really surprised me. It's just how good the digitization was. Uh, you can understand why this game took so many discs. I would not be terribly surprised if the audio for Sinistar took <laughs> a, a, the majority of a disc. As far as I could tell, once you load this off disc, it's in memory. There's no more loading. There wasn't for me anyway that I noticed. Uh, and... Um, so that's once you endure the opening disc volley, it's not so bad. It is a game that requires you to use uh, the only one drive. It won't. Uh, it won't. I would at least it wouldn't let me use multiple drives. I tried this on the uh, Coco Three, my actual Coco Three, and I also tried this on the X Roar um, online emulator, and it and both worked. Both worked fine. Uh, you can play this with the joystick or keyboard. It does have one or two players. Uh, now, it's hot seat, and it also supports the deluxe joystick with one button doing your cinnabombing and one button uh, doing your shooting. So it, it sort of it does get a lot of the things right uh, when it comes to uh, it comes to the way the game works. I think there's about, I don't know, five phrases in the Coco version, so I know there's more in the arcade, but it's not, not too many more, frankly. It's close. Uh, and... Uh, um, the Coco ones, are, I think, are just as audible. So I'll give it that. Also, when you complete a level or you die, uh, you get a little tune. Uh, it's a, it's almost sounds like a little digitized song, which that may be what it is. And it's not bad. So, I mean, that's pretty much the extent of the music, but it's it's not too bad, uh, if I'm honest. I, I, I'd have a problem with it. The game also has a pause feature, and uh, which is always nice. Uh, so they give you a lot of the luxury items that you need. Now, in the manual, it mentions that later rounds, uh, the Sinistars will cloak and and themselves and other objects from the scanner. I did not get far enough, apparently, to see this, uh, but I'll take the manual's word for it. It's funny, the manual has a lot of... There's a lot of things that aren't spelled out in the manual. Like, it doesn't tell you what the different radar uh, colors are. It doesn't tell you the scoring. It doesn't tell you, uh, like, what's going to happen as you progress. It really doesn't tell you much of anything. It'll, it literally will tell you. You'll find out later, or you'll find out when you get there. You know, so <laughs> didn't mess around there. Um, if we look at the ports uh, together with the arcade version, which I've got up if you're watching at home, so you can see... On the right-hand side of the screen, how the arcade version is just zipping around. It's like uh, bugs going around a flower or something. It's crazy with everything spinning around. The Coco version is much more, uh, is much slower, much more laid back. But it's, I like I said, I would love to have something in the middle. I would love to see a, a, the processor update being implemented on this so we could get that squeeze out just a little more speed. And I think if we did that, uh, you would. You, this might be right in a, a sweet spot because it's it's too slow, really, for my likings on the Coco version, but much too fast in the arcade. So if we could get it somewhere in the middle, uh, we'd be laughing. You'll notice, of course, that there's a there a vertical versus horizontal. Uh, they do a they do a decent job of clipping out, a, you know, the sides with the border, to, you know, but it's still it's horizontal. Uh, it's so that, but you know, it is. It, it's not a huge change in a game like this. That actually, Sinistar is a game that you you can go either way, and it doesn't make much difference just because of the amount of scrolling space you've got. You can also notice if you're looking at the screens, the Coco's radar is just immense <laughs> compared to the arcades. I will say the arcade game boasts some awesome audio uh, sound effects and some incredible explosions. And stuff, and uh, that you know, some of that from R.J. Michael, but uh, the Coco version does have a few flourishes like that, but it's not in the same. Of course, you're talking about X's and O's in terms of power, you know, the, and capability. The fact that the Coco is pulling this off at all, I would, I, I find quite amazing, uh, if I'm honest. Um, I really didn't see any reviews on this per se. Coming out in '89, uh, it, it just there was a lot of action. On, in terms of reviews, I did look up. Uh, I looked up what you would pay for uh, a, a uh, upright Sinistar cabinet these days. These things are going for over two G's. <laughs> so here's the alternative: 
pick up a Sinistar with two A's for the Coco. I believe it or not, I did see someone selling one of these on eBay for ninety nine dollars. Now again, what you're going to be getting are three five and a quarter inch discs and a paper manual in a in a plastic sleeve with a Ziploc, the old Ziploc bag. So that's what that's what you're getting when you buy this thing. Uh, but you know, it's I, I don't know how many of these are around. I would wager this is probably a fairly obscure title to to collect. So if that's your cup of tea. Uh, this might be the game for you. But overall, uh, I, I enjoyed the game. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. And there are a few downbeat note, down notes on it. The, the one that gets me the most is the fire coming from the, the gunships is so tiny. It's literally little red pixels. And it is difficult to dodge because it's difficult to see. Uh, so that's one thing I wish that would have been a little. I wish there'd been a little more, like in the arcade version, they used the classic uh, Williams shooting where the you leave like a streak, like it's like it's like a line, you know, as opposed to just a dot. I mean, and Williams they love that, you know. If and you you could reference Robotron twenty eighty four. I mean, the shots are long and cool looking, and it makes them easier to see. Although, I'm not sure the Coco could pull that trick, but they could at least, if they could have at least made those bullets a little larger, uh, that would have helped. Because uh, against the immense background, uh, it makes them hard to see. Uh, but overall, aside from that, that's really my, that and the speed are really my only uh, complaints. I think this plays a pretty darn good game of, uh, uh, of uh, Sinistar. And uh, me personally, I would have no trouble uh, recommending this one uh, to people. Now, I will say I did have some people uh, that uh, had some trouble getting this to work on the Mister, our good buddy Pajaka, who always sends in a review. I had a rough time uh, getting this one to go. In fact, I don't, I, I don't know if he ever got it working. I did recommend to him that he could go to uh, that he could go to the online version, and that one would work. Uh, so th there was that. Now, with all that said. Did get a nice review here from L. Curtis Boyle. Uh, L. Curtis writes, uh, The first third-party 512 game for the Coco 3, this was a favorite of mine when I bought it in 1989, even though one had to load three discs each time one played it. The game supports one to two players, features full digitized sound and speech, and features almost everything the arcade original had, except for one thing, speed. It's not super slow, but it's definitely slower than the arcade original. This may be something I need to visit in the future with a 6309. I agree with that, Curtis. I, w I really would like to see you do that. Dave ended up using the highest vertical resolution, 225 scan lines, to get as close an aspect ratio of the arcade as possible. This mode actually stretches beyond the top of the regular TV. The digitized sound and slash speech really helps the game as it did in the arcade. The beware I live causes the hair on your arms to stand up every time you hear it. The graphics are very well done, and the gameplay is pretty solid and very reminiscent of the arcade. The mining of the Cinnabombs, the radar, the top 30 scores rather than the top 5 or 10 are all there. A lot of fun. And I would parrot that. I think they really nailed it. And, of course, you know, again, David is really was the master of catching... The spirit of the arcade game on the Coco uh, and doing the best he could to capture the graphical flourishes and the, and, the, and the gameplay elements. But he really, I think he excelled in this sort of game. And this really may be, I mean, this was probably the most ambitious Coco arcade conversion he ever did. And, I mean, this one stands right up there. I mean, I, I would put this right, right around the same area as, like, Donkey King or the King. I mean, this is a this would not be a di an easy task to convert this over, and so I think he did an excellent job. This is definitely one I think uh, you would enjoy checking out. So, with all that said, as you know, we are currently in early November. I would like to mention that coming up uh, the day after Thanksgiving, as always, uh, will be the Thanks for Giving Marathon. I believe this year, let me look at the date here and make sure I know when it is. It's the day after Thanksgiving uh, in the USA. Uh, and what it is, uh, is tw 8 to 10 hours 
uh, myself and hopefully the Brent uh, going to work playing nothing but crazy games nonstop. It will be uh, it's going to be Friday, November 29th. That's the that's your date right there. Friday the 29th. Uh, it's when it all goes down, and that should be a lot of fun. We're always have a good time. I'm sure we'll get some Coco games in there as well as like, everything else. It's just uh, me and Brent. It's just our way of saying thank you for supporting us all year long and just having some fun and uh, hanging out. You know, uh, I mentioned on our, some of the previous shows, if you listen to the other things in the rotation, the Brent's been uh, marred with a series of unfortunate family crises that require him to just basically drop out of everything and handle them. And things are progressing somewhat. Uh, the uh, successful and safe birth of his granddaughter uh, is a great step forward. And hopefully, I'm, ho- I'm hoping that he'll be back around uh, sooner than later. Hopefully sometime by December. And if not, hopefully he'll be back full time in January. So, I should mention that the next Coco show uh, is going to be a real fun one. Because it's going to be December 22nd, uh, and that's a Sunday, and it's going to be, guess what? Let's go ahead and reveal it now. It's the Coco Show Christmas Spectacular. Uh, This year, for Christmas Spectacular, we're going to play a couple snow-related games. We're going to do a double. We'll be taking on Skiing and Horace Goes Skiing. So it's an all-skiing spectacular uh, on the Coco Show. That will be uh, taping December 22nd, uh, Sunday. It should be a lot of fun. Just in time for Christmas, get your Coco on and have a good time with all your Coco pals. Now, next week on the Retro Rotation, uh, we're back to ARG Presents. We're going to be looking at uh, games on Russian. We're basically, basically looking at Russian arcade games is the topic of next week's game. This is going to be a real wing ding. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think we're limited to arcade. I think we we can, uh, it's like computers. It's going to be Russian-based. That's the one thing I do know. Uh, and I'm going to start looking long and hard and getting some tips on good games to play. If the Brent's back around next week, then we'll pick two games. If it's just me, then I'm just going to pick the one game and look it over. But it'll be fun. We should have a good time. And we do hope you'll uh, join us when we release that one. That's all we got, everybody. I want to thank everyone for hanging out with us today. Thank you very much for continuing your support of the Coco Show. And uh, I'd like to personally thank everybody for all your kindness to- for the Brent and uh, for our well-being. We appreciate it. We hope everyone has a nice November, and we will catch you next time. And until then, all hail L. Curtis Boyle. Home. Home. Run, 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 run. I live.